Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight. This Sunday, I want to remind you that we are going to take the Lord's Supper together following the sermon uh, message, uh, which will follow the song time. At least that's the plan. And uh, you can pick up the elements here at the church in the, in the lobby, or you can provide your own. But we invite you to, uh, to join us after the sermon for the Lord's Supper this Sunday. Now, if you would, after I pray, join us in song. The first song we're going to uh, uh, sing is a worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the basic line we want to just grab a hold of, it's all because of Jesus. All because of Jesus we are alive and have every other gift. A little more about that in the sermon as well. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for the privilege to gather through this means tonight in our homes, but together in spirit. Be honored in our worship. Be honored in our trust in you. Work your perfect work in us and through us, and we pray for your perfect blessing upon those who are single and alone at this time, that they would know a deep, deep sense of your presence. We pray regarding the married couples and the families as well, that they would know as well a deep sense of your work in them to be a blessing to one another. Be honored. May joy come to your soul. Lord Jesus, through this time of worship, in your name we pray, amen.
Good evening. Tonight we're going to talk about the joy of the ascent. Open, if you would, to Philippians chapter 3. One positive side of the COVID-19 season is sabbatical. Kind of a time, for many of us anyway, to get alone, put a little extra thought into life, a little more study of Scripture, a little more time in prayer, a little more counsel from other people by way of phone calls, but just a time to kind of get alone and rethink, you know, what is life all about? What's the meaning of life? Where's your thinking at this time? As an individual, as a couple, as a family? Where is your thinking? Complete this sentence, if you would. One thing I do is. Or, another way to put it, my one central goal in life is. Many possible answers to that in American society. But what is yours? If we come out with God's answer, the journey toward that goal will produce great joy. Let me ask you a question as we talk today about the joy of the ascent. Why do people climb mountains? I was talking to Keith Miller, one of our members last night on the phone. And uh, he's spent some time climbing some serious mountains. He's a guy you got to get to know him. He's a newer member of the church. And um, he's told me about training periods and climbing times. Uh, one of those mountains was Mount Rainer, Rainier, I'm sorry, Mount Rainier uh, in Washington. It's a, um, about a 14,000 foot high mountain, about uh, 10,000 people a year attempt the journey, I believe. He trained for about six months, trained on mountains like Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams and the like. Training is grueling, painful, rigorous. Why in the world, Keith, would you want to climb the mountain? We make helicopters these days and planes and go into space. Why do you want to climb that thing? And his answer was pretty quick. He didn't even have to think about it much. The first thing he said, if I remember correctly, was the need for a goal. You know, and, and I get that. It's, it's, as one other mountain climber put it, it's the essence of the human spirit. We're just created by God. We are hardwired for goals. We're hardwired for adventure in, in achieving those goals. We're hardwired for doing and a, a, attempting to do very, very difficult things. We're hardwired, many of us are hardwired to climb mountains. What's the alternative in life? Just kind of sit around and be aimless, be apathetic? Now, I get his answer, the goal. But, but he also said this, in the pursuit of the goal, training for the goal to reach the peak, more important is the journey. There's something in the journey that just excites and exhilarates the human spirit. And he said also important is the team that around you are like people training to reach that peak and then climbing that mountain to reach that peak together. The goal, the journey, the team sounded a lot like Christianity at this point. It's addictive, this mountain climbing thing. It's hard, you suffer. And if you stay with it long enough, you will know somebody who dies in the experience. But it's just how humans are wired. Why do people attempt hard things? Why do we have hard goals? Sandy Manili with triathlons and numerous 
of us with sports. I'm not talking about golf, I'm talking about sports. Why, why do we attempt all of this? What, what is it on the inside that just drives us to climb a mountain? Well, we're going to look at that today from a Christian perspective. Using this way that we're hardwired in God's direction. Let me uh, review kind of quickly, uh, but not too quickly. And the reason is, is I've been asked some questions about this uh, passage that we covered last time, chapter 3, verse 1 and following. And I, I want to make sure we don't get the acceptance of a gift where we bring nothing to receive a gift from the achievement of a goal which is built on the gift, but has nothing to do with achieving the gift. Uh, we got to separate the two entirely in our minds. One is the foundation, and one is the climb. And they need to be separated, but the climb comes from the receiving of the gift. Let me, let me explain. In chapter 3 and verse 1, we have these words. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in... In the Lord. If there's a theme of chapter 3, that's it. Rejoicing in God. This whole series in the book of Philippians, in this COVID 19 series, is about experiencing joy, fullness of joy. And so we continue with that same theme in chapter 3 and into chapter 4 later on. Finally, brothers, rejoice in God. The Lord. Everything we're going to read about is is you know has that as its um, as its essence, as its centerpiece. Rejoice in the Lord, not just rejoice, but rejoice in the Lord. And if we're going to do so, we need to follow these instructions. First of all, verse two: Beware of folks that are going to just bring in religion into your life and completely devour. Your joy. They're like dogs, ravenous wolves that will just eat you up. And that's the nature of every man made religion. Verse 3. Really, it's the same as verse 1. Here's what's true about us who are the true circumcision, who have the miracle of having our hard hearts made soft before God. That's circumcision, true circumcision. We do three things one, we worship in the Spirit of God. Two, we glory in Christ Jesus. Three, we put no confidence in the flesh. And there's a stark contrast between one and two, which go totally together, and number three. If you got number three going on, you can't experience number one and two. If you got number one and two happening, you've taken care of number three and continue to do so. Chapter th uh, three, verse three. We as believers worship, that's the same as rejoice in, that's the same as celebrate in the spirit of God, heart to heart. There's a tremendous joy between us and our God of joy, our Lord of joy. And again, we talked about heaven being a joyous place. Why is heaven a joyous place? Because it's filled with the God of joy. And the kingdom of God is joy in the Holy Spirit along with his work of righteousness in our hearts. Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We worship in the Spirit of God, heart to heart. Here, here's the focus of our worship. We glory in Christ Jesus, which is the same as saying rejoice in the Lord. I don't think there's any difference between the two. We glory or get excited in Christ Jesus, in our relationship with Christ. As we focus on Christ, there's a tremendous joy in our hearts. There's a, a glorying, a, a, a getting excited about Christ where we, where we are rejoicing in Him. That's our lifestyle. All day long, every day, no matter what else is happening, we feel sorrow, but at the same time, we have an unceasing joy in Christ, in our focus in Christ. If we're going to have that, Number three has to be true. We put no confidence in the flesh. And then Paul illustrates this with his own life. I've received a bunch of uh, achievements. Verse five, circumcised on the eighth day. That's when a Jewish male should be circumcised, according to the Old Testament. My parents did it right, in other words. Got great parents of the nation of Israel. Got the right pedigree. 
not, not just Israel, but their tribe of Benjamin, one of the best tribes. They evidently had one of the best football teams at the time, or soccer teams, or basketball teams, or whatever. Uh, but it was an outstanding tribe, as tribes go. None of them really were outstanding, but, you know, as they go, uh, comparatively. A Hebrew of Hebrews. I mean, I was, man, I was totally into this Jewish thing, which is the same thing as saying I was totally into God and into godly society, according to the way we define the terms. As to the law, Pharisee, went to seminary, study God's law, God, the first five books of the Bible. Man, I knew the law, I thought. As to the law, Pharisee, as to zeal, man, I was pumped. I was excited. I didn't just believe in God. Man, I was pumped about God. I, I even tried to destroy the church, which I thought was against God and harming my religion. So I was zealous. I mean, if anybody was into God, man, it was me. I was totally into God. As to the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. I, I, I had no, I mean, I just lived the perfect life. Zeal for God, believed in God, at least what I thought I knew. And we had, if he would go on to explain things, we had corrupted things a lot to where we could live in a blameless way. We so externalized things as religions go today. By the way, have you ever thought, why is there so much joy in Christianity, any legitimate church, is a place of tremendous joy. We have reverence at the same time. And go to any other religion in the world, there seems to be an overall joylessness. Why is that? Islam in particular. I've been to many, many gatherings with Islamic leaders in their, in their sanctuaries. Absence of joy. It's, it's the man-made religion thing. They just got to somehow merit achieving something before God, so maybe God will not squash them, and maybe they'll get some blessings from God. Just man-made. Christianity, it's just joy from beginning to end. The day you got saved, remember the joy when you got saved? Filled with Jesus was everything on that day. And if you've been living in God's word with God's people, there's been a joy ever since. And may that joy continue to grow in your life and in my life and in our lives corporately. So, verse 5 and following, you know, Paul's laying down, man, the cool stuff in his life that he thought was good. By the way, if you jot down in reference to verse 6, as to the law, blameless, in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, he says, now that I've become a Christian, I am the worst sinner I know. But he's faithful to say that with incredible joy because my salvation isn't based on me. It's completely based on what Jesus has done for me and the gift of righteousness, which he gets into at this point. A stark contrast between all the religions of the world that will devour your joy and Christianity where you're given the gift of the Savior himself and with it joy forevermore no matter what else happens. Now he's going to describe that. Verse 7, whatever things were gained to me. Now I want to track three themes in verses 7 through 9. Three different themes. All right, stick with me. Again, we skimmed these verses last time, but I want to take the time to make sure we got these. Verse 7, three, three, uh, three themes. First of all, the things that were gained to me. In other words, verse 5 and following, my achievements. That list and many other things. Whatever I've achieved, these things, I did what? I counted as loss. So all the, all the, all the religious achievements I'm, I've done, moral achievements, societal achievements, every good thing that anybody could attribute to me as a good thing, it's loss. I count it as loss. In my mind, I reckon it as, as, as complete loss. Verse 8, I count all things to be loss. That's all the good things I've ever done, to be loss. You know that, again, by verse 5 and following. That's what he's talking about. That's the, that's the context. Later in verse 8, 
I've suffered the loss of all things. Later on, next phrase, I count all things to be rubbish or stinking trash or dung, as we spoke about last time. Just a pile of dog poo. So, first theme is, all the good things, I count them as garbage. Now, now, why, Paul, would you do that? You were super pumped about how good you were. Blameless. Man, you had achieved in your religious circles. But now you're saying all that stuff, I just count as dog poop. And I chuck it. I throw it in the dumpster. Second theme is, what did he want more than his self-righteousness? And for some folks, we are just so enamored with our self-righteousness, nothing tops it. I plan to stand before God and bring my pile of dog poop and go, God, let me in. That's a bad plan. It's a really bad plan. Here's what got Paul's attention. What got him off of his pile of dog poop. He says this, verse 7. Whatever things were gained to me, these I have counted loss. For what? For the sake of Christ. A person, not a plan, a person. Verse 8. For the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Further in verse 8. That I might gain Christ. Verse 9. That I might be found in Christ. What got Paul's attention off of his self-righteousness? Christ. He met Christ. And I would say to you, take Christ, put him here, and put all the best leaders that have ever lived on the planet around the globe here and look at, at the best of, of, of the best in all of the best. Christ is here and everybody else is here. When you get to know Christ, he, you, your life is just enamored with him. You want to get to know him better. It was how long ago now? Uh, 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 40 years-ish. I met Christ. And nothing else mattered. He is it. He's everything. He's who I'm enamored with. Everything else doesn't matter. My achievements, whatever, none of it matters. It's all about Christ. And so Paul met Christ as he was a terrorist. Christ interrupted his life. Uh, you can read uh, uh, Acts, uh, History of the Early Church, chapter 9, has Paul met Christ. And from that point on, Christ is all that meant. He just wanted to know Christ. Third theme, and we're going to come back to the theme of Christ because that's the Bible. By the way, in knowing Christ, verse 1, he rejoices in Christ. Verse 3, he glories in Christ. He wants to know this Christ. Third theme I don't want to pass over, though. Verse 9, I want to be found in him. I want to gain him. I want to know him. I want to gain him. I want to be found in him. Verse 9, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law. In other words, God's moral standards and you know all the times I've achieved those moral standards, which, by the way, because everything good you've ever done is tainted with sin, it would be zero. But nonetheless, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, because, by the way, there is nothing on your ledger pad. Isaiah says all of our righteousness is like filthy rags, or he would say here, all of our righteousness as, is as poop. Nonetheless, not a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Listen, the righteousness which comes from God. Rivet your attention on that phrase. Verse 9. The righteousness that comes from God. What must the righteousness that comes from God be? Well, you need to know because it's a gift to you when you know Christ. When you gain Christ. When, you be, when you're found in Christ. When you trust Christ. You're given this gift. It's not your righteousness, and your righteousness has nothing to do with it. Your righteousness is over in the dumpster. 
It's the gift of God's righteousness. How righteous, if you have the gift of God's righteousness, how righteous must you be? Righteousness means rightness. How right, how good must you be if you have the gift of God's righteousness? And that's who you are in the Lord. You have become as righteous as Christ is righteous. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. We are given the gift of Christ. We are given the gift of His righteousness. His righteousness comes with Him. A great read on this would be Romans chapter 3, verse 19 through the rest of the chapter. As a family, it would be a great passage to study. It's contrasting the two righteousnesses. One, that which is achieved by the law, and nobody makes it that way, and nobody is even slightly righteous that way. The other is the gift of the righteousness of God, which comes through, what's the word there? Faith in Christ. Not achieved, not earned, faith in Christ. And that's spoken twice. Verse 9. I want to be found in Jesus. And with him comes the gift of righteousness, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is, or the righteousness which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith, of trust. So twice, he's making sure we got it. How do we receive the gift of righteousness? By trusting Christ, placing our faith in Christ. Now, that's a gift that's received by faith. When I say that, righteousness, total forgiveness of sin, the gift of righteousness, but that's just part of the package. The real package is Christ. For the sake of Christ, knowing Christ, that I might gain Christ, that I might be found in Christ, that I'm in Christ, that Christ is in me, that I'm united to Christ forever. That's the gift. And with that gift comes the gift of being made right before God, which is completely forgiven and made in right standing. Now, I want that gift, which leads to now the lifestyle. And you've got to separate the two. You've got to separate verse 9 and and previous to verse 10 and following. I want to know him. Who's the him? This is Christ. Verse 1. I rejoice in Christ. Verse 3, I glory in Christ. Verse 8, this is interesting. I give up everything for the surpassing value of knowing Christ. Now that knowing might be what we're talking about here, or it might be knowing the gift of being in him and the gift of his righteousness. You can kind of take it either way. But this knowing plainly in verse 10, and it works either way. When you, when you use that word knowing in verse, in verse 8. You, you can do it either way. It works either way. In verse 10, I want to know him. I, I want the gift of righteousness. I want the gift of Christ. Not just to say that I'm righteous, but now I want to know him in great detail. And let me describe, Paul says, the power of his resurrection. So I want to know Christ, and specifically I want to know his power. Well, what what, what power is that, Paul? Back in chapter 1 of the book of Philippians in verse 6, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. So God began a work, if you're trusting Christ, he began a work, and by his power, he will complete it all the way to the time when you die or when Christ comes back again. Chapter 2, verse 12, we're told this, you have the gift of salvation, now live out your salvation with fear and trembling, in other words, with deep reverence. Why? Because it's God who is at work within you, both to will and to do his good pleasure. What does he say? God's power, God himself and his power is residing in you to guide you and to empower you to do what he wants you to do. 
So we've already met this power of God in the book of Philippians, and now he's going to uh, emphasize that a little bit more in this passage. It's the power to live, chapter 2, verse 1 and following. This whole thing of a ministry of encouraging others and consoling others and giving friendship to others and showing affection and compassion, of putting others above ourselves, of looking out for the interest of others, of going all the way to the place of death as a servant to do those things. It's the power. We're talking about how hard that is. It's the power to do that. So I want to know him, the power of his resurrection. Uh, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 1, the end of that chapter, described this as the same power used in raising Christ from the dead. And he prayed that we would know that power at work on the inside of us. So as we look at these hard things to do, these next to impossible things to do, even worship, you know, we're just drawn away by the enticements of this world to keep our mind on Christ, to keep just enamored by Christ and not be taken away by all the glitter and the glamour. It's quite frankly spiritual work. It's hard. But God empowers us, the same power that raised Christ from the dead. We should expect to see at work in us. We still need to apply that power with all diligence. And we spoke about that in the past. That I might know him. I want to know his power at work in me. I also want to know the fellowship of sharing in his suffering. That's not what I would have put on the list. But I want to know him so bad. I mean, just check this heartbeat out. I want to know him so bad that I want to know his, his, his power to grow me and to guide me into ministry. I want to know his power resident on the inside of me that I might become like him all the way to, to sacrificing even to the death of, for the welfare of other people. I want to know that power, but I also want to know Christ so much that I know when he was here, he suffered a lot. I know that today... He's inside of believers, and he still chooses to make himself vulnerable by loving us, by indwelling us, and he's suffered once for sin. That's done. But he suffers today. When you suffer, if Christ is in you, Christ suffers. That's an amazing thing that God would do that. And so Paul says, I, I, I want to know him in every area of, of his being, including this thing of how Christ goes through suffering. And you can read as many volumes as you want on that, but until it happens and you walk with Christ in the sufferings that he allows or even brings in our lives, we're not going to know him in that way. And so Paul says, I, you know, I've come to a place of reckoning. I want to know him so well that I even am excited about going through difficulties and pains and my life being even in the balance more about that in just a second be and we're going to close with this with with, with this with this uh, with with this uh, verse being conformed to his death suffering all the all the way to knowing what it is to be conformed to his death what's he talking about Here's a few other passages to help. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 31. Paul says, I die daily. Yeah, I just when I get up in the morning, I just I just reckon that my life is not about my life is not my own. It belongs to Christ. I die to self that I might live to him. And I do that on a daily basis. That's just that's what I do when I wake up in the morning. Luke chapter 9, verse 23 and following, Jesus has told us the same thing. If anyone, not, not the elite, but if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself daily and take up his cross, an instrument of death, and follow me. That's just any believer. We just come to a place where we lay it down for the Lord. A daily willful denial of me living for me that's the joyous life in uh second corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6 and following we have these words for god who said 
Light shall shine out of darkness is the one who has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. In a nutshell, he's saying when we look at Christ, we see the glory of God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When we look at the face of Christ, that's language to say when we look at the heart and soul and life of Christ, we see the glory of God. And that enraptures us for the rest of our lives. But the next verse, he says this. We have this treasure that's the knowledge of the glory of God. That's the illuminating power of God to know the glory of God, the character of God. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. That would be these old bodies that are affected by COVID-19 and other things. We have this treasure the knowledge of the glory of God in these earthen vessels. Why God? Why, why, why are you allowing decay to take place in my body and bad things to happen to my body and possibly me to even contract COVID-19? That the surpassing greatness of the power may be of God and not from us. God wants to display his power through us, even through our decline and possible death. He's illustrating in the next verse. We're afflicted in every possible way. We're not crushed. We're perplexed. We don't understand all that's going on. None of us do. But we don't despair. We're persecuted by bad people, but we're not forsaken by God. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. Listen now. Here's the key. Verse 10. Always carrying about in this body... The dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus, so I put those two phrases together, always experiencing in this body the dying of Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our body. He explains it this way, next verse, verse 11. For we who live are constantly being delivered over to death for Jesus' sake. That would be persecution, but God can deliver us in other ways, medically in other ways. That, why? why? Why, God, do you allow this to happen? Here's the point. That the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our mortal bodies. Bottom line, death works in us, but life in you. So we come back to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 10. I want to know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I don't think I've ever prayed that, by the way. But that's Paul's desire. Don't know if he prays it, but that's his desire. Being conformed all the way to his death. What, what, what does that mean? Well... The best passage we have in the book of Philippians on that would be chapter 2 and verse 5. Kind of our key passage for this series. Have this attitude in yourself, which was also in Christ, who although he existed in the very form, God did not count equality with God, a, a thing to be grasped or held onto, but he emptied himself taking the form of a servant, being found in likeness of man, being found in the appearance as a man. Listen now. He humbled himself all the way to the point of death, even death on a cross. How did that section start? Have this attitude, this mindset in yourself, which was in Christ Jesus. Jesus had that same attitude as Paul. I die daily. Jesus had a physical body, which he could have dictated all of his moves for his own happiness. But all of his choices were dictated for the joy of others. And in that, the paradox is a life of incredible joy. 
even being okay with death working in us, that life might work through us in others. Well, I got to confess to you, this is hard stuff. But please know this. The foundation of a joyous life is this, to know Christ. And I'm talking about verse 7 through 9. To know him judicially, to know his gift of righteousness, to, to know the gift of his indwelling presence. What do, we re, what do we do to receive that foundation? Nothing except trust Christ. Or I should say, get rid of any self-righteousness we have, throw it in the dumpster, come to Christ and trust him. So basically nothing. And we receive the gift of him indwelling us, his righteousness indwelling us when we trust him. Period. So the foundation is to know Christ. What's the peak? What, you know, we're ascending to the peak. And you can read a little bit later. I'm not going to do it now why we're using that title. Just read on, kind of pray through this passage in regard to verse 14 of the upward call of God. What's the peak? To know Christ. What's the foundation? We receive the gift of knowing Christ. What's the peak? To know Christ. But to know him experientially, verse 10 and following. To know his power. To know his fellowship. And that doesn't happen just through devotional time. That happens through living, chapter 2, verse 1 and following. And as we do so, we make each other's joy complete. We refer you back to previous sermons regarding that. Well, as I'm, I'm thinking through this, I, I try to make things simple. It might have been made things more complicated than ever, but the Spirit of God will guide your heart. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, so much for this great privilege to be able to trust Christ and receive the gift of Christ, the gift of His indwelling presence, the gift of the righteousness of God which comes with him, the gift of your presence for all of eternity. And in that gift, our hearts are filled with joy. We rejoice in the Lord. Thank you also for the high call upon our life to know Christ experientially. To know Christ and His power at work in us to bring about this life You've called us to of living as servants for the welfare of others. This life of allowing us the privilege to go through sufferings with Christ very present that we might know him in that part of his being, conformed all the way even to his death, that we might know what it is to truly die to self daily. And so, Father, anew and afresh, I lead us in prayer. I want to trust Christ as my Savior. No turning back. I trust Christ. I turn from my self-righteousness. I turn from every other sin. I turn to Christ alone. I trust Him for the gift of His presence, for the gift of Himself to live in my life. Now, Christ, guide me into this life of sacrificial service to others. And Lord Jesus, guide all of us into the experience of growing in our knowledge of Christ as we live a life of Christ-like self-denial and service for the well-being of others. And in whatever way COVID-19 can be used by you in any of these things, 
use it, Father. And in these things, we trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. Call us anytime. If we can be a blessing to you in any way, you just need someone to pray with, somebody to talk to. If you want to talk about trusting Christ as your Savior because you're not sure about your relationship with Christ or anything else on your heart, you need us to go to the store for you, whatever it may be, call us anytime. Our numbers are all over the website, um, and uh, use any of those cell numbers or office numbers or email that you elect to, uh, uh, to use. God bless you. God make you a blessing.